Good evening, everybody. I hope you're doing great. Um, this is David Vaughn, and I'm coming to you actually on a recording. Um, recording this on Thursday, a few days before um, the Sunday night that it will show. And I uh, hope that is okay with you. We are uh, needed to uh, be able to uh, do some things, and so this helps me to, to be able to record it for you. I try not to do that too much, but I have done it some, as you know. Uh, but I'll go ahead and, and uh, spill the beans that yes, I am recording this. This is my Thursday clothing. So anyway, I hope you're doing great. Uh, this is our last uh, Sunday night online Bible study of the uh, year 2021. Uh, we'll take the 26th off, which will be next Sunday. And then we'll take the following Sunday, uh, January 2nd off and then we'll resume on January 9th with something uh, to be determined. I'm not sure exactly what yet. I've got a few ideas but um, kind of kind of thinking through that a little bit more, praying about it and uh, we'll go from there. But we have this year tried to focus on our Bible in one year readings and we've stayed with that uh, for the most part. Uh, we might have been a week ahead, a week behind here and there as far as what we're talking about and maybe spent a little extra time uh, talking about some things like Job or um, Esther or whatever, uh, things that might be less familiar to us. But um, I wanted to go ahead and run this list by you. These were the things that I felt like uh, we had discussed this year, um, either in part or in whole. But uh, out of the 66 books in Scripture, uh, we did Mark, Luke, John, uh, some Exodus, some Leviticus, Job, First and Second Kings, Esther. We did Psalm 119, which is pretty long. Uh, we did Isaiah a week, at least one week on Isaiah. Then we did the Minor Prophets, um, and that kind of corresponded with First and Second Kings in some ways. But Amos, Hosea, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. So we did quite a bit of uh, meandering around there through the scriptures, and hopefully that was was a good thing for you. I sure I sure enjoyed it. Um, but anyway, I, I don't know exactly how that will uh, play out next year with our Sunday night, uh, maybe reading plan or whatever we're doing. But anyway, I was kind of encouraged by the list of these that we were able to spend some time in this year, and hopefully that's enriched your walk. Um, it's interesting as you think about um, this timeline that I've thrown up there from time to time, uh, no pun intended, um, that... Uh, we spent some time in the creation when we were in Genesis and Exodus, the the early wanderings of the people uh, and the time in Egypt and uh, the, the kingdoms and their uh, division into two and their um, the uh, exile um, into Assyria and Babylon and Persia. And then you have uh, a, a period that I hadn't really talked about a whole lot um, you know, if you look on the end of this uh, under Greek Empire, <clears throat> there weren't really any books included in our New Testament uh, or Old Testament written during this time frame. But, uh, but yes, once the Roman Empire comes to power, uh, we know that that is the time of Jesus. Uh, we know that uh, the Gospels and the uh, books of, of uh, the New Testament were written during that time. And so, um, anyway, there's a, a lot of things that could probably be discussed there. The, the time in between um, Malachi and Matthew, so to speak, that 400-year uh, period between the Old and the New Testament. What's going on there? Um, you know, the apocryphal books. Uh, again, the Catholic Church recognizes those as part of their scriptures. Uh, a lot of it is history uh, related to uh, the Jewish people. Um as Romans were coming into power. Uh, but anyway, it kind of sets up what's what the culture is like uh, going into the New Testament times and the birth of Jesus. So anyway, that's outside the scope of what we're talking about. But um, it is interesting to think about that 400 years of, of what I consider quiet. Uh, we know God's still working, but he's not uh, speaking through the prophets um, in a way anymore, uh, at least in the ways that uh, end up in scripture. So, um, anyway, um, that, that, that kind of, uh, line there, uh, as we talk about it has 
you can kind of see there's one story, and I guess that's what I wanted to focus on tonight. Uh, the Bible, although it's made up all, all those books that we discussed right there, and all those are individual stories in some ways. You could look at the story of Jonah, uh, or the story of Job, or any of the prophets, or the Gospels, or whatever. Um, you could take any one of those and look at it as an isolated story, but if you know me at all, and you've been in any of these, you've heard me talk about context. And what I mean is each one of those is the part of a bigger, greater story of God. And so whenever we you know, hone in on something, it could be a New Testament letter of Paul, or a gospel, or any of those things I just mentioned, and we ne ignore, neglect the the overall story of the Bible, we're missing out on something. Uh, we're missing out on a big, a big thing. It's like picking up one chapter of a book. You're going to get some of what's going on. It might be slanted in a certain uh, way because you are looking at a particular episode, if you will, or a story or a set of stories in the big story, but you're not going to get the full picture. And so looking at the big story of God from Genesis to Revelation, uh, we've tried to highlight that and say, look, it's important to understand context of what's going on here. And I hope that's come through in our, um, in our studies. And so um, anyway, it's interesting to me, uh, you know, why is this important? Why is this significant? I've listed four or five places uh, up here on the screen where you can actually get within Scripture, within the Scriptures itself, a an example of someone or a retelling of the Bible story, at least up to that point, right? So whoever wrote Psalm 78 and Psalm uh, 136, they're recounting God's story from creation to the current or some segment of it for a purpose. Nehemiah 9, which we'll look at here in just a second, if you want to find that in your Bibles, uh, is a retelling of the story of the people as they recovenant and they recommit to God. Remember, Nehemiah was written when they were rebuilding the walls because they all are confessing their sins. They know that they're forefathers and they have not been faithful so they retell the story and then you have in verse uh in, in hebrews 11 in a way we've not really looked at it this way or discussed it but it's a listing of the heroes of faith well it really starts with creation and goes on into the current christian age um current to to the hebrew writer and uh and then you have act seven which is the uh, stephen's speech before the Sanhedrin, and he's kind of talking about the history of Israel and and up to that point and how the people are stiff-necked and stubborn and they're not realizing that Jesus is the next part of the story. So telling the story of God is all throughout scriptures. Um, it's interesting that the story is telling about itself. Um, and so I want to just look at two of those. I want to look at the Nehemiah 9 and the Acts 7. You're welcome to look at these other ones. Uh, on your own, and they all kind of do a different version, different purpose, maybe in emphasize certain parts of the big story uh, more than others for their purposes, but that's kind of uh, what's going on. But let's look at Nehemiah chapter 9, again, uh, in the context of them confessing their sins, but I want you to, to mainly get the idea of the big story of God. Don't, don't miss that in what I'm saying. If you miss the details, that's fine grab the big story of God that's being told by Nehemiah and the priest as they're retelling the story to the people. We're going to do this with Nehemiah 9 and Acts chapter 7, and then at the end, I'm going to ask the question, why is this important? Why is it important? Why is what we've done this year on Sunday nights important, where we've talked about the bigger story of God and these, these stories and why they fit where in context? Why is that important? To retell that, what do we gain from that? What does anybody gain from that? And so let's uh, let's jump right in. It says the Levites said, "Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts." 
the earth and all that's on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. So what is what is the the episode or the, the part of the story? You're talking, about, you're talking about creation. God, we're praising you for creation, giving life, and the, the starry uh, skies and the earth. Okay, so what else? Let's go to the next part. You're the Lord God who chose Abram, brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and named him Abraham. So he jumps kind of next to Abraham in his story. You found his heart faithful to you. You made a covenant with him to give his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. Well, that's a mouthful. But you kept your promise because you're righteous. So he's talking about the, the covenant God made with Abraham, right? He kind of skips the, uh, uh, the fall and the... Uh, the story of Noah, and he jumps right to Abraham, who would have been the, the forefather, right, of the Jewish people. And uh, so it goes from creation to Abraham. I think that's interesting. And he talks about the covenant he's made. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. Well, what's, what's that about? Well, we know that uh, the family of Abraham ended up in Egypt, right? It was uh, Jacob and his son Joseph and the brothers and they're crying out in slavery now, uh, and then they're uh, crossing the Red Sea, right? And you hear their cry. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh in Egypt, right? Against all his officials, all the people of his land, for you know how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. You divided the sea before them. So they passed through it on dry ground. You hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. You recognize this story, right, as the crossing of the Red Sea. Now they're in the, the land between, which we actually talked about on a Wednesday night back a year and a half ago, maybe, um, the wanderings. Uh, this is prior to that, actually, but they're being led by a pillar of cloud. In, in the daytime, by night, with a pillar of fire to give them light on the way they were to take. Okay, then there's Mount Sinai. You came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws, just and right, decrees and commands that are good. He's talking about what? He's talking about Mount Sinai covenant, and he's talking about the Ten Commandments, right? Um, particularly. So you kind of see the story, right? Creation, Abraham, Egypt, Mount Sinai. He's pulling these people out. You've made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through who? Now Moses assumes uh, a prominent place in this story. So they're retelling the story. In their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven called manna. In their thirst, you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in, take possession of the land. You had sworn with uplifted hand to give them, but they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff-necked, and they didn't obey your commands. They refused to listen, failed to remember the miracles you performed. They became stiff-necked, and in their rebellion, appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you're forgiving God, gracious, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, bounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them. So, the story is being retold. Um, you know, when the, when Moses is up there on Mount Sinai, and they're appointing leaders, and they're upset, and there's rebellion, and Aaron throws stuff into the fire and a golden cow. I mean, this whole thing is being retold, right? Uh, this whole part of their negative, yucky part of their story is being told, but he's highlighting God's faithfulness, patience, long-suffering, goodness, graciousness. Um, I find that to be very interesting. And even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf, right? And said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Or when they committed awful blasphemies. As of your great compassion, you didn't abandon them. The pillar didn't fail to guide them. The pillar of fire by night uh, didn't quit shining. Because you gave your good spirit to instruct them. You didn't withhold the manna from their mouths. And you gave them water. So you didn't abandon them for 40 years. Now we're into the wilderness part of the story. They... You sustained them. They lacked nothing. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their feet didn't become swollen. Now they're allowed after that to take over, right? To to eventually inhabit the land, right? Um, this is all under Joshua's 
um, conquest of the land. So you see how the story is being retold in the presence of all these people. Uh, back in Nehemiah's day, this was the story that they're retelling. You gave them kingdoms and nations, allotting them even the remotest of frontiers. They take over the country of Sihon and Og. Those names appear frequently in the Psalms, actually. You made their children as numerous as the stars in the sky. You brought them into the land. You told their parents to enter and possess. Children went in. You subdued uh, the Canaanites before them. Uh, gave them into their hands, the kings, peoples, uh, so on and so forth. They captured fortified cities and fertile land, possession of houses, wells already dug, vineyards, all grows, fruit trees. They ate to the full, were well nourished. They reveled in your great goodness. And here in the story, we're going to see another turn. They were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed your prophets. Who'd warned them in order to turn them back to you, they committed awful blasphemy. So you delivered them into the hands of their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven you heard them, and in your great compassion you gave them deliverers. You rescued them from the hand of their enemies. I, I get the idea those are the judges. You know, the, the whole um, tribe tribal areas had been established, and then... Um, they would rebel and, and serve idols and, and do awful things. Uh, and the, the, like the Philistines would come in and take over um, and raid them. And then they would cry out and God would send deliverers and judges, uh, Deborah and Samson and, and Samuel. And then the kings, right, uh, would also show up. Um, eventually they cried out. But as soon as they were arrested, they again, it was evil in your sight. And you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so they ruled over them. And when they cried out, you heard from heaven. In your compassion, you delivered them time after time. Yeah, that was a repeated cycle. You warned them not to turn your back. They sinned against you um, stubbornly, stubbornly, stiff-necked. They refused to listen. I'm kind of paraphrasing now. For many years, you were patient. By your spirit, you warned them through whom? The prophets. Another part of the story is the prophets and the prophetic voice, right? Yet, we all know that they didn't really listen to the prophets, so they gave them into the hands of the neighboring peoples. Well, who was that? Well, the Assyrians and Babylonians, and then the Persians. But uh, God did not put an end to them or abandon them because he's gracious and merciful. All right, so this is uh, where Nehemiah is telling the story. You know, the people have been uh, allowed to come back. Nehemiah has sought, uh, he heard about the ruins, right? And he's, he's going to go back and repair the wall. Uh, the remnant that was left there. And so he's going to close his retelling of the story with this. Now, therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, don't let this hardship seem trifling. The hardship that's come on us, our kings, our leaders, our priests, our prophets, our ancestors, all your people from the days of the kings of Syria until today. So the Persians had actually uh, resumed the... Um, um, Assyrians, Babylonians, and now Persians in Nehemiah's day uh, had come to power. And so um, that's what he's talking about there. Um, let's see, I think I skipped. And all that's happened to us, you've remained righteous, you've acted faithfully, we were wicked. Our kings, leaders, priests, ancestors didn't follow your law, they didn't pay attention you war about the things you warned them to do, even while you were, they were in their kingdom enjoying your great goodness they didn't serve you or turn from their evil ways, but see, we are slaves today, Nehemiah says. Slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so they could eat it, the fruit and the good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you placed over us. They rule over our bodies, our cattle. We are in great distress. So Nehemiah is telling the story with the... Um, with the eye to God's faithfulness and goodness. You've been good, God, to us. Throughout this whole story, we've been horrible. And uh, he even closes with, in view of all this, we're making an agreement, putting it in writing, affixing their seals uh, to it. And so that's, um, we may have gone over this before um, in our uh, Nehemiah study, but it's probably been a year or so. But here's Nehemiah recounting the story of God. Okay, why does he do that? 
Why does he remind them? You guys are part of a big, long story, part of story. You know, why are you part of the biblical drama of God that unfolds? And uh, they didn't know anything about that at the time. And they kind of did. You know, they didn't know there was necessarily going to be a written book passed down for generations available to everyone in the whole wide world, Gentile alike. But they did know they were part of God's chosen people and his story. Nehemiah is telling them about it up to that point. And actually, we know, uh, we're going to see here in this next part, Acts chapter 7, Stephen is using the same thing. He's using the story of God to preach to the Sanhedrin and tell them even more so what's their place in the story uh, going forward, right? And uh, so I'm hinting a little bit at, my, at the answer to my question, but let's look at Acts chapter 7. So the high priest asked Stephen, are, you, uh, are these charges true? And he's talking about the blaspheming uh, that Stephen was supposedly doing. And he says, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The glory of God appeared to, where does he start? Abraham, while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said. Go to the land I'll show you. So he left the land. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you're now living. So Stephen's like, on this very soil while I'm standing, Abraham was sent. So he gave him no inheritance, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess it, even though at that time Abraham had no child. So he's referring to the earliest call of Abraham to leave Ur and to go to the land I'll promise you and I'll make you a great nation and from your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It's in Genesis. He's going back to Stephen's going back to Genesis thousands of years before uh, before his current day, right? Stephen was 2,000 years before us, and Abraham would have been maybe 2,000 years before Stephen. So this is the, the, the sor sermon, excuse me, the story that Stephen is telling. And he's saying, yeah, Abraham didn't have any kids, but God spoke to him for 400 years. Your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. What's he talking about? He's talking about Egypt. And they're going to be enslaved and mistreated, but I'll punish the nation they serve as slaves. Afterward, they'll come out and worship me in this place. He's foretelling, yeah, I told Abraham this is what's going to happen. Your people are going to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, and they're going to be called out to come right back to this place. Well, we know that's what happened. And Stephen knew it, and the people he was talking to, the rulers of the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, knew that this is what had happened. So, but he's reminding them of the story. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. Abraham became the father of Isaac, circumcised him eight days after his birth. Isaac became the father of Jacob. Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs. You know, those men, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, so on, Joseph, Benjamin. They became the 12 tribes, right? Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph. They sold him as a slave. Okay, so he's going to include the Joseph and uh, the Joseph part in his telling of the story. But God was with him and rescued him. Gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to give, gain the goodwill of Pharaoh. Pharaoh made him ruler. Um, then a famine struck Egypt and Canaan. Uh, ancestors couldn't find food. Jacob heard there was grain in Egypt and he sent these brothers to look for food. And then the second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. So Stephen is, is telling this story and he's got an eye to the whole uh, Jacob and Joseph thing that that Nehemiah didn't share, but it's still part of this big story. Um, it's fascinating to me. Um, and um, so, oops, I jumped a verse there. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Jacob went down to Egypt where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem, placed in the tomb. Abraham had brought, excuse me, bought. And uh, as the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, uh, the people in Egypt increased. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. That's a quote from scripture. The Old Testament, he dealt treacherously with our people, oppressed them, forced them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. Remember, that was what was going to happen to Moses. Um, but at that time, Moses was born. He was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. You know that story where Moses was placed in a basket 
in the Nile, and Miriam watched over him, and Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, was powerful in speech and action. I'm going really fast, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to get through this. But Moses was 40, he went to visit his own people, he saw one of them being mistreated, and he went to defend him, and he was um, he killed this Egyptian. And uh, Moses thought his own people would realize God was using him to rescue them, but he did, but they didn't. So Moses thought, "I'm rescuing my person from my my Hebrew brother from being attacked," but nobody really acknowledged that. So uh, let's see what happens next. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting, and he tried to reconcile them by saying, "Men, you're brothers. Why are you hurting each other?" Well. Um, they're saying, who made you ruler and judge? And they, uh, they taunt Moses a little bit. Are you going to kill me too, basically? Moses he hears this and he flees to Midian and settles as a foreigner and has two sons. Forty years later, an angel uh, in the burning bush appears and he goes over to get a closer look and God reveals himself to Moses saying, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Moses was afraid, and then the Lord says, This is holy ground. Take off your sandals. I'm watching my people in Egypt. Now I'm sending you back. And um, Stephen says, Well, this is the same Moses they'd rejected. But he was sent back to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt, performed wonders and signs to Red Sea, 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses whom, uh, who told the Israelites, God's going to raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. Okay, now Stephen includes this saying that Moses says there's going to be a prophet that's going to be just like me, a great prophet. Now again, the two people that the Jewish um, uh, people revered more than anybody was Abraham, the father of the nation, and Moses who gave them the law and led them out of slavery. So Moses says there's going to be someone like me coming we need to pay attention to that. And so um, that's how Stephen's using the story. He was in the assembly in the wilderness um, with Sinai, and he received living words to pass on. But the ancestors, our ancestors, our forefathers, didn't obey. Instead, they want to go back to Egypt where they had full pots of meat. They asked Aaron to make him a god. We don't know what happened to Moses. And then they formed this calf out of the fire and sacrificed and reveled and God gave them over to this and um, interestingly uh, Stephen quotes something from the book of the prophets about bringing sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness um, Molech which would have been an evil god of um, I believe that was who they often sacrificed their children to um, anyway uh, so he's now saying Stephen now acknowledges, remember the part of the story where God is going to send us, our forefathers, into Babylon because they obeyed, uh, did not obey God, but they worshipped idols? Okay, that's the part of the story that's coming up next. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law. It had been made as God directed them. Um, they received it. Um, they talked about the time of David. Anyway, I'm going... Uh, but then it was Solomon who built the house. It wasn't David who built this house for God. It was Solomon. And, uh, and then Stephen says, but God doesn't live in the house made by human hands. Um, he um, who built the world is in all things. All right. Now, Stephen uh, has got himself worked up into a frenzy. And, and I'm going to mention a little bit about that. But I, I want to come back to why he's telling the story. So now Stephen is calling the Sanhedrin, you're a stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. By the way, them's fighting words. Um, was there ever a prophet your ancestors didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the one Moses talked about. So uh, now you've betrayed and murdered him. Jesus is who he's talking about. You've received the law that was given through the angels, but you haven't obeyed it. Well, when they hear this, they are furious, they gnash their teeth, and that leads to uh, Stephen being killed and uh, being stoned. Remember, who was there at his death was the young man named Saul, who we know to become Paul. Okay, 
Anyway, without getting sidetracked into the Stephen story, the function of the story of God in the Stephen story is what I want to focus on. So here you have two examples, and we mentioned uh, Psalms, a couple of examples. Hebrews, when the writer of Hebrews talks about um, what is faith, and it's the, the fact that we believe by faith that God created the heavens and earth. And he talks about all the different people who were led. Okay, it's, it's the story of God that they're telling. Um, and so I guess my, my point is we, um, we have tended to break the big story up into bite-sized pieces, right? What did you learn today uh, in Sunday school? I learned about Moses. Okay. Which story about Moses? Well, I learned this story about Moses. What did you learn today? I learned about Daniel the Lion's Den. I learned about Jonah. I learned about... And it's kind of all this mishmash of stories that are just flowing around in our brain and in our... We know they all go together because they all came from the same... They all came from this same book, but we don't really know what they have to do. And we know they're about God somehow. You know, that the kids are always say, well, what's the right answer to the question? Well, just say Jesus, right? That's always the right answer. Well, we don't really know how this, all these stories fit together. And so I hope, my hope has been to lay out in, in varying degrees of detail the stories of God found in his scriptures this year as we've been reading through the one-year Bible to be able to help us each kind of understand this is all part of one big story. The creation to the call of Abraham to the call of Abraham's, uh, uh, the people of Abraham being called out of Egypt and Moses being the leader and entering the land and them not, them breaking covenant with God and the judges and the kings and the prophets and, and, and along with the prophecies of God's going to put you in exile, there's going to be one who's coming that's not going to be like the earthly kings and leaders you've had. His name is going to be Emmanuel, God with us, and he's going to be born in Bethlehem and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then when the birth of Jesus occurs, then you have his ministry, his, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the birth of the church, and then our place in that continuing story is the current church um, manifestation of God's of Christ's body here on earth and so um, it's not a bunch of disjointed moralistic stories uh, sometimes we think of the Bible in terms of, of that do good don't do evil that is true um, but it's also about some other things so I want to ask this question why is it important to know and to retell this big story of God Okay, why is, why is this important? And uh, I want you to think about that just for a minute. Why is it important to know? And I've, I've said a few things in the context of our, of our classes and this class, why it's important. Um, because I do think one reason is that things get jumbled up in our head and we kind of forget this is all God behind the scenes moving and, and he's got a plan to rescue his people and to call a people and have them be his own and be like him. and um, So that's important to not just tell a story from the Bible. It's, it's certainly, and I don't, I'm not saying it's not okay to, I'm not saying that it's bad to tell to focus on Daniel one Sunday or focus on Moses or some small bit of the story. It's just that when we never connect at all in the big story, we're missing out. Um, because that's one of the majestic, mysterious things about Scripture is that all these people, all these writers over centuries wrote and the story still connects. It all connects, even though they had different locations, different styles, different aspects of the story. Um, it all connects as one big story in a way that it really has to be miraculous and supernatural and divine. Uh, I think that's a testimony to the Word of God being uh, His Word, inspired Word. And so that's one thing. Um, I think uh, points out God's character. I think it keeps these from being disjointed, uh, just kind of, like I said, moralistic sort stories 
Like um, if you pray, then um, God's going and, and you're in the lines, then God's going to rescue you. Well, that's true in Daniel's case, right? Um, obeying Jesus is the best way. Obeying God's right. Okay, yes, but that is such a simplistic surface level understanding that that's what we teach our kindergartners and our preschoolers, and they need to know these Bible stories, and they need to understand those kinds of lessons from it, but we must grow past that, um, I believe, as adult Christians to understand more depth and more insight into what God's bigger picture was. And so, um, and all of it, whether it's Habakkuk or Obadiah or Mark or Exodus or Job or whatever. Um, so, so I want to point out two, it's actually uh, interesting, I want to point out two scriptures, two short scriptures, and we're going to be done, of things that I think are significant about what the Bible says about telling its story, okay? And uh, so let's, let's look at those real quick. The first one is from Deuteronomy 6, and that whole chapter is worth, especially as a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, uh, just for ourselves, reminding ourselves over and over again about the Shema, uh, hero, uh, hero God, uh, hero Israel, the Lord is one. Um, you know, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and and uh, those those commands, okay, um, are being repeated. So let's look at this end of chapter six. But I think this is interesting. In the future, when your son asks you or daughter, what's the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws that God has commanded us, okay? So imagine you're a kid. You're like, why did God give us all these rules? I want you to see what the the what Moses writes here. Here's how it's here's how you're to explain it. Tell him because because God uh, likes to make rules and He wants you to follow the rules and He wants you to be a good person and rule rule keepers and good people are the people He likes. That's not the way Moses says it. Tell him, we are slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. He goes straight to story. God rescued the people from Egypt with a mighty hand. So, I mean, all the plagues, remember the ten wonders, uh, leading, uh, ending with the death of the firstborn? Um, that's what you're to tell your son, okay? Whoops. Um, before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh, his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees, to fear the Lord, so that we might prosper always and be kept alive, as is the case today. Life is what Moses says. Life, prosper and be kept alive. Tell them the story that God saved us. God saved us, our people. He gave us these rules to keep us safe and alive and prosperous, right? And I'm not sure we always teach that um, in that way. We may teach be good, but, well, but, but why be good? Be good because you will be blessed and you will be alive following God and being under his protection and under his mighty hand. And um, that's a little bit of a nuance and a clarification there, but that's one of the reasons why we should tell the story of God. Why, why we should all tell our stories of God when God has been good to us and rescued us and healed us and saved us from our sins and bad decisions and 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 watched out for our safety and kept us um, kept us in his hand. We share those stories with each other, with our children, with our children's children. Um, uh, that's what Moses is saying. And then he says, And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God as he commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Let's look at one last uh, verse here, Romans 15, 4. For everything that was written, according to Paul says this, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we're going to have hope. All right, you catch that? The endurance and encouragement, we're going to have hope. 
So the scriptures are the stories in scripture, everything that was written prior in the past, the endurance that's taught and the encouragement that they give is going to give us hope. It's going to fan into flame the hope that we have to be saved, to be part of God's kingdom, to be part, to be all that he intended for us to be in creation that we corrupted. And, um, Anyway, I love that. It's one of my favorite reminder verses um, in the New Testament in Scripture. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. You want to have hope? I do. We need it. And my hope is that uh, by reviewing and discussing and Placing these stories in the bigger story of God will be reminded of the endurance that, that we can have, the hope, the encouragement, the blessing uh, of God that we can receive if we keep, keep his word and tell his story and uh, to each other and remind each other along the way when we get discouraged. All right, my time is way past due. Um, I'm going out with a bang. So... Um, Anyway, God bless you, and I certainly hope uh, this has been a, uh, an encouragement to you. And um, again, just kind of a final reminder about why it's important to understand God's big story. And uh, anyway, thanks for being with me and, and uh, watching this and participating. I hope it's been a blessing, and uh, we will uh, plan to get together in a couple of weeks. Look forward to it. Uh, God bless.